Thank you for tuning in to our sixth edition. There is no collapse. Hi, I am the Vulcan, and this edition is called All Roads Lead to Rome. For those of you who may have missed the other installments, you're wondering who am I? I'm the Vulcan. I'm the one who does the daily Vulcan reports. You can also find the Vulcan report on my website. All links to pertinent information are found below uh, the description of this video. I highly encourage you to subscribe to, uh, to the website because I put out a lot of content and I do not have time to make videos on everything that I post there. Sometimes uh, you'll find live trades posted there, commentary, analysis, you name it. Our latest video that we did, Vulcan Report, was on Bitcoin. And uh, I, I need to know how many people are interested in me incorporating the Bitcoin into the daily market forecast videos. If, 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 it's, if it's that many people that, uh, that like it and benefit from it, then I'll, I'll keep it. If not, then I'll just discard it and, and keep it moving. All right, so now, those of you who are wondering what I look like, here you go. This is me, the Vulcan. All right, let's move on. All roads lead to Rome. All roads. Rome is the new world order, and it's also the old world. It has never gone away. It is still alive and well. One only has to look at the collapse of the Roman Empire as a world power and look at what really happened. Rome hasn't gone anywhere. The Vatican's still there, and it's still in power, and always has been. The power behind the power. There you have it. In a nutshell, all roads lead to Rome. As this relates to what our topic of discussion has been, dealing with the markets and the financial instruments used to enslave the masses, is through debt. And this debt is going to be used and rolled into this new crypto type currency this digital electronic currency this one world digital currency incorporated under the umbrella of the one world religion and everything is going to be just one one and one part of today's system of fractional reserve banking and fiat de facto instrument of debt currencies run by the central banks are all regulated through the international monetary fund and that's an institution created by the United Nations at its birth to principally enslave nations to debt and to control them through debt. As Rome expanded, it was by and large a very good place to live for its day. The Roman Republic had developed a system of representative democracy very similar to our own. Uh, the laws were precise and fixed. Judgments were not arbitrary nor capricious, and Roman citizens had extreme privileges and rights within that system. One of them was the bread and circuses. Poor Romans could uh, find themselves, you know, quite poor, like today's poor people, and they were the common class. And they oftentimes couldn't feed themselves. And they were guaranteed free bread, free bread by the state. All right sort of like bread lines back during the depression or food stamps today all right and they gave them entertainments theater plays music etc gladiatorial events you name it that's what they use to lure the people to sleep today we have television internet and things of that nature taxation is slavery rome would learn to adapt in very incredible ways, just like America has. Yet another great challenge confronted Rome. To serve in the Roman armies, you had to be a free citizen and not be of the, you know, the, the plebeian class, but one who owned land. 
The Romans believed if you did not own a piece of Rome, you had nothing to die for. In other words, if you didn't owning a house is the American dream. Where have you heard that before? To further their perspective of the true Roman warrior, you likewise had to also be single, with no wife and no children. Hence, our armed forces today do not care about families. They will give you orders and send you, ship you halfway around the world, and who cares uh, what happens to your children or spouse or what have you. They don't care. All right. Um, now, the thing that you need to note here is time went on. Okay. Things began to take shape. All right. Now, when free Romans died in war, okay with no heirs to leave their lands to, a few things happened. The first was that the patron class and the Senate often bought the lands on the cheap, foreclosure ring a bell, consolidating more and more Rome's productive farmland into fewer and fewer hands, i.e. the 1%. Much like today, the corporations consolidate more and more of lucrative businesses and commerce into fewer and fewer hands. I mentioned the roll-up in the earlier vids. The, the second thing was that they were more often than not to use slaves to work the lands and jobs became more and more scarce. Much like the corporations today use automated robots and assembly lines or cheap foreign workers, i.e. sweatshops. Okay? The third was that fewer and fewer free Romans owned land and had no wives and children to join the army. So divide and conquer, right? Winning the world through arithmetic. Alright? Like Caesar, who was an ambitious man, also of little social standing at birth, but with powerful benefactors, he would follow a similar path to accumulate initial wealth and increase social standing enter the military and politics and distinguish himself at both as fortune would have it Caesar once elected council would have the privilege of leading his army to Gaul which is modern-day France to lay siege to its rich lands and plunder it wealth he would use wisely at uh, ingratiating himself to the citizens of Rome. At one point, Caesar made it to the Rhine River in Germania and daringly bridged it to march his entire army across. He marched for several days on the other side with no opposition from the fierce German tribes. Yet he discovered something, something that will be reinforced when a short time later he would visit uh, Britannia. The world seemed to stretch on forever, and even a person as ambitious as he would be hard-pressed to conquer it all in one lifetime. He discovered another thing, that he could vastly multiply his own forces by setting competing tribes and kings against one another arming them with information and intelligence and weapons and gold and exploiting their rivalries uh, would save him men and time and in essence so weaken the victor in the process they were then much easier pickings to conquer them later. Caesar realized that the world could be conquered through simple math dividing people by exploiting their differences priming them to fight one another over their differences and then profiting off of that fight and then seizing victory later over the weakened victors. Rome would learn to use nationalistic, ethnic, and even religious differences to prompt people into destroying and killing each other for it. Have we not seen that in modern day? Everything from Black Friday to Hurricane Katrina to people getting shot over iPhones and starter jackets back in the late 80s, early 90s. Caesar realized that deploying skilled agent provocateurs 
such as we had during the G8 summits and stuff back in 09, 010. To exploit these differences, prime them and capitalize on them would give Rome great advantage. So these agents, of course, would have to work with a certain degree of secrecy. After all, they had to, um, they would be rejected if they out and out told people that they were exploiting their plans. So these would lead to the birth of intelligence agents and spies and secret societies. Okay. So when you look at uh, the Stoics, when you look at Stoicism in, in general, what does it mean? It's the endurance of pain or hardship without a display of feelings and without complaint. All right. That's how they that's that's the purpose for which they um, brainwash their citizenry we use the media to accomplish that today Romans who highly prized stoicism as an ideal would develop a curiosity in the Christian cult not to be confused with the followers of Yahashua all right this cult was a reinvention all right and it promoted all the things that the empire would eventually need in its citizens to carry out Caesar's plan of total world domination. All right, when we say Caesar, bring it to modern day. We just mean the power elite, the 1%, all right, the shadow government. The Romans were slowly being prepared to be weaned off of bread and circuses. The legend of a new god was being created for them and slowly brought to life. A legend that would change the Roman world and with luck ensure its conquest of it. A legend that would continue to grow through political maneuvering and events. The wealth of the empire was being slowly consolidated into fewer and fewer hands. The free citizens slowly being killed off in the wars. The slave population growing even larger. Bring it to modern day continue wars going on for decades that the US is engaged in and we open our borders to immigration coming in here see a repetition all right a slave population that as planned would grow to include almost everyone on the planet through the new system and what better way to govern them than with a slave's religion so they used a new slave's religion that shunned earthly goods and sought a meek and subservient manner to the authority of God. Over the next hundred years, the classic Roman Empire would reach its zenith, spanning well into Eastern Europe, dominating the entire Mediterranean, the Middle East, and into Persia, to the island of Britannia, Egypt, and much of Africa. The wealth of all these lands flowed back to the Rome and into a smaller and smaller number of Patreon families who continued to consolidate and hoard it. A vast network of roads connected it all so that wealth could easily flow back to Rome. All roads lead back to Rome. Anyone who resisted the new system was left in a progressively weaker and weaker state. Sound familiar? Argentina, Brazil, Zimbabwe, the Weimar Republic, and on and on and on and on it goes. All right, you get out, you, you get out of favor, you do something they don't want you to do, or fail to do something they want you to do, and they cut you off. Okay, the Federal Reserve Act, World War One, and the Balfour Agreement. Let's dig in. Passed into law by carefully selected. Uh, number of sessions of Congress handpicked by President Woodrow Wilson just two days before Christmas in 1913 the Federal Reserve Act once more placed total control of the nation's banker and banking under London and the fake Hebrew Khazar House of Dan and the Papal Rothschild family thus the Federal Reserve Act was born the wealth of the nation was once more concentrated into one foreign controlled financial institution that could be turned on and off and used as leverage and incentive or punishment at any time by Rome. As dominant European empires like the Ottoman Turks and the Tsarist Russians and the Australian Hungarian Empire they were pitted against France and English 
the bloody trench war perfected in the final days of the American Civil War would wreak carnage upon Europe as never seen before. Now, when we talk about usury or interest or debt, we have to look at how we were warned about such things many, many millennia before. Most notably would be the Bible. What does the Bible say about lending money? Whether you believe in the Bible or whatever you believe about the Bible, nevertheless, there are some very important truths mentioned therein. God's word says that many people wander from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs when they allow money to have an improper hold on their hearts. That's why the Bible contains hundreds of verses on how God wants us to treat money, and this includes the lending of it. Moses addressed this issue in the Old Testament. Essentially, the Israelites were not permitted to charge interest when they loaned money to an impoverished brother. They could, however, charge interest on loans made to other more affluent Jews and to foreigners. This rule was part of the Mosaic Law. If you lend money to one of my people among you who is needy, do not be like a money lender. Charge him no interest. Exodus 22:25. You can also see Psalms 15.5. This prohibition against charging interest actually included food or anything else that may earn interest. Deuteronomy 23.19. The purpose of the law was twofold. An interest-bearing loan would only exacerbate the plight of the poor. And God promised a blessing on the gracious lender that <clears throat> would far surpass any interest he would make. Additionally, at the end of every seven years, creditors were to cancel all the debts they were owed by fellow Israelites. Deuteronomy 15.1 In the New Testament, Jesus tells us not to turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Matthew 5.42 He applied this principle even to our enemies in their time of need. Quote, but love your enemies and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, end quote. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Indeed, there are numerous passages throughout the Bible exhorting us to have a generous and giving heart, especially to the less fortunate. Moses taught his people, If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of these towns of the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Rather be open-handed and freely lend him whatever he needs. Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8. The clear teaching of the Bible is that God expects his children to act righteously when lending money. And it helps us to remember that our ability to produce wealth comes from God. Deuteronomy 8:18. And it is God who sends both poverty and wealth. He humbles and exalts. 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 7. Now there is nothing wrong with legitimately loaning money and expecting to be repaid at a fair rate of interest. Proverbs 28, 8, Matthew 27, and Psalm 37, 21. Yet we need to remember that the Bible's teaching on money matters also includes borrowing money and indebtedness. Although the Bible does not expressly forbid borrowing money, it doesn't encourage it either. It is not God's best for his people, as debt essentially makes one a slave to the lender. Proverbs 22, verse 7. God would rather have us look to him for our needs than rely on lenders. Additionally, as the psalmist makes clear, we are to repay our debts. Psalm 37, 21. When we loan money to someone, we increase that person's debt load and make it easier for him to stumble. Someone once said, before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. There is no doubt that friendships have been strained or even lost 
due to the lending of money. Yet, if both parties stay within biblical parameters, there shouldn't be a problem. Nonetheless, to forego jeopardizing a relationship you value, in some situations a gift may be better than a loan. God expects his children to give to those in need, so we give of our time, talents, and treasure. As Jesus taught us, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Now let's look at, there's a couple more passages here because I want to bring this emphasis home and you're going to need to refer to this later. Romans 13 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Proverbs 22 7. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Proverbs 13 11. Wealth obtained by fraud dwindles, but one who gathers by labor increases it. And finally, Proverbs 22, verses 26 and 27. Do not be among those who give pledges, among those who become guarantors for debt. If you have nothing with which to pay, why should he take your bed from under you? Stay tuned for the next installment. We will call that um, Part 6, uh, Chapter 2.